Never say the devil can't got all the funky music. <laughs> How many of you appreciate our band? Show them some love. Hallelujah. I want you to do something with me real quick. I want you to just, if, if you're opposed to holding hands or whatever, just reach over and touch somebody. Just make a point of contact with your elbow to elbow or ankle or something. Uh, just touch somebody right now because I want to lift up Rodney uh, Outlaw and uh, in the house today. I want to, us to lift him up before the Lord. And uh, the doctors have, have noticed that his white blood cell count was way, way high. And uh, so he is in the hospital and has received a first round of chemo. But I'm going to tell the devil he's a liar today. And we prayed, we prayed, we prayed, we prayed when they had no children. And now they have two beautiful boys. So I know the Lord didn't give him seed to take him out. So I'm declaring right now that life is coming into Rodney right now in that hospital room right now. God, we declare that the white blood cell goes into its normal range. The red blood cell in its normal range. God, that his blood line up the way you made him. We rebuke cancer. We rebuke lies. We rebuke the devil. We rebuke sickness and disease and the enemy trying to come against his life and take him in this moment, God. And we declare that he will live, 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 live and not die in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout, Rodney, live in Jesus' name. Come on, say it again. Say, Rodney, live in Jesus' name. Now put your hands together like it was your prayer for your body, for your life, for your brother, for your friend, for your husband, for your... Hallelujah. Come on, thank God because he's already done it. 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 You may be seated. Hallelujah. You know, God has set things in motion. And he's not, every time we move around, every time we do something, God's not looking at us trying to figure out how can I judge them appropriately? How can I do that? How can I do this? How can I do the other thing? In other words, like there are laws that are by God. They, they, they're his law. It's gravity. You jump off the building, you're going to hit the ground. And every time somebody jumps off, God is not thinking, should I let gravity work right now or should I uh, let them float? What should I do here? I wonder. No, it's already set in motion. Come on, y'all. And if you jump off the building... You're going to fall, right? Well, the scripture says that by his stripes, we were. Somebody needs to grab hold of that. Past tense. We were healed. That means the healing has already happened. Oh, come on. I'm trying to talk to somebody today that needs to recognize that your healing is already available. All you got to do is line up with it and agree with it and walk into it because it's already there. Somebody say, my healing is already here. My healing has already taken place. And the sickness is the sham. Oh, y'all. The healing is the reality. Hallelujah. So we declare life in Rodney right now. Life right now. Life right now. I can't wait to hear the good report. Life right now. I can't wait to hear the good report. Life right now. There was a Sunday some years ago, right here in this building, right here, I spoke and said there's somebody that God is going to do a blood transfusion over. And there was a lady that stepped out about the fourth or fifth row back there. And when she stepped out in the aisle, she looked like she was almost intoxicated or something. And I knew it was her, but there were two other women that came. 
And so there were three people in front of me, but I knew that this particular one that God had healed was the one God was speaking about. I didn't know anything about her, didn't know anything about going, what was going on. She came down, I laid hands on her, she laid out the floor. Her, she had a little grandson with her, she was probably about eight or 10 years old. He sat on the floor right beside her. And they stayed there for a long time. And after the service, she went home and her daughter evidently lives just a few doors down from her. So she went to her daughter's house and uh, she said, told her daughter, she said, I don't even remember coming home. I don't remember driving home. I don't even know how I got home. And her daughter looked at her and said, well, mama, why are you smelling like roses and spices and stuff? Why are you, why are you wearing roses? And she said, I'm not wearing roses. She said, yes, you are. The whole fragrance filled my house when you walked in. Her daughter looked at her for a minute and she walked over and she just smelled right by her mom. She said, yeah, it's you, it's you. And she said, and all of a sudden I was right back where I was when I was on that floor. I knew it was nothing but the glory of God. She goes to the doctor the next day. She had an appointment to go to the doctor. When she gets to the doctor, they had diagnosed her with a rare blood cancer. Now, you know, if they pull your blood, they can tell your history by your blood. They can say, well, at one time you had cancer, one time you this happened or that happened or another thing happened. They pulled her blood and they said, we don't know what's happening here. This is not the same blood we were looking at. Come on, somebody. This is not the same blood we were looking at when we first diagnosed you. You have totally brand new blood. Something has happened here and there is no history of that cancer even in your bloodstream. I'm declaring the same thing over Rodney. Come on, somebody. I believe God is more than able to do a blood transfusion right under the doctor's noses. Hallelujah. And thank God for doctors and thank God for good doctors, godly doctors, praying doctors. Thank God for studying doctors, but thank God for Jesus most of all. Come on, somebody. Thank God for Jesus most of all. Hallelujah. I'm not going to be real long today because we have this uh, lunch over here, but I just want to, I want to lay something out for you today. And uh, I, I want you to, whew, man, I'm so full. In this season, in this season of Christmas, in this season of talking about his birth again, in this season of going back over all of those things, something that just so dropped in my spirit. Um, you know, it seems like that these days, everything is a test. <laughs> and if it wasn't a test when you went into it, you didn't think it was a test, by the time you came through it, you realized, boy, that was a test. You got on the other side of it and you realize, man, what a test that was and how crazy is that? You know, it's what, what blows my mind, I guess, is that people don't live from the word anymore. We live from Facebook to Facebook, to Instagram, to YouTube, TikTok, So all you're doing is wasting your time. We take our texts, <laughs> our beliefs, our thoughts, our theories, and then we all try to preach on Facebook. Can we be real today? Can we be real? Y'all get out of Facebook and get your face in his book. People, anyway, I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone, but I want, I want to say something to you. I want to say something to you. It is, if I were going to title the message today, I would just say it is the spirit that gives life. The spirit gives life. Somebody say the spirit gives life. You know, there's, Everybody wants to hold everybody to rules. 
Go on, shout me down this morning. <laughs> I know it's Christmas time. But church folk, everybody wants to hold everybody to rules. We want to hold everybody to um, our beliefs. And we want to hold everybody to what we think the Word of God is saying. What we interpret it to say, even though we've had no study, we've only heard somebody else say it. And so we think that's what it means. It's like I heard a preacher preaching one time and he was preaching out of Isaiah where the scripture says in the King James, God is trying to work and who will let him? And in the King James, when it says who will let him, the man preached just crying, oh, God's trying to work, but nobody will let him. And I thought, man, if God's trying to do anything, who could stop him? Who could stop God if he wanted to do something? You have to understand that the King James, you almost have to have an etymological dictionary to understand the King James because you need to understand the history of the word. The word let literally in the old English, in the old King James vernacular, it means hinder. God is trying to work. Who will hinder him? The court, the, it's a rhetorical question. Nobody. Nobody's going to hinder him. And so we get through Moses. We get all of these laws and we get the commandments and we get all of these things. And they're written down and they're written down for a people that is hard hearted hard-headed, not listening to God, not trying to walk with God, but they follow after everything else. And so he says, I'm going to have to make it real plain for you. I am the Lord your God, and there is none other beside me. Now that's just as true as true can be. Then he says, don't make any graven image. In other words, that they almost one and two almost sound alike, except that one is him stating who he is, two is stating to us, and don't you try to carve out nothing that you think is me, because you can't even imagine who I am. So don't try to get no wood, no gold, no stone, and try to make a low God for yourself. And if you do, then let that speak to you because it can't talk. Y'all good? So <clears throat> Jesus comes along. The Bible says that we got the law through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Somebody say grace, grace. and truth. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, Truth is always good, but it's never good if it's not seasoned with a little grace. Are y'all here today? You have to season the truth with grace. And if you don't know how to walk in grace, then don't expect grace to be given to you. So Jesus takes the Ten Commandments in the fifth chapter of Matthew, and this is not even where I'm, I'm trying to preach from, but I just, I just want to lay this out here for you. And he starts talking to the people. He said, you've heard that the commandments say you must not commit adultery. That's the law. He said, but I'm saying to you, Anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. That's the spirit. <laughs> Come on, y'all. The first one was the law. The second is the spirit of the law. Can I say that again? The first one is the law. You don't commit adultery. 
But the whole spirit of that is that even if you look at her with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Why? Because it is, that's the spirit of it. That's what I'm trying to get to you. This is deeper than words. Are y'all with me? It's deeper than words. He's, he goes on and he talks about all kinds of things. He says, if your eye, even your good eye, cause you to lust, gouge it out, throw it away. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, cut it off, you know. And he said, you've heard the law says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say to you, a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Everybody's like, oh man, there's a bunch of us in trouble, huh? <laughs> Understand this. There are two words for the word divorce. Divorce is a written law, but there's also divorce that means put away. I didn't give you a written bill of divorce. I just put you back in the harem somewhere. Can tell I'm gonna have to preach on that one sometime when y'all ready to listen to it because it this this trips people up a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce he can do that that's what the law says you can do that you can get a divorce by a written bill of divorce but listen to this I say to you a man who puts his wife away unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a put away woman means she's not divorced. She's still married to another man, but you married her anyway. Oh, y'all. See, you gotta study the word. Is this helping anybody? Y'all like, I don't know if it is or not. I don't know. The ancestors told you, don't break your vows. Carry out your vows you make to the Lord. He said, but I'd say to you, don't make any vows. Don't make promises and commitments. Watch this. He said, I say to you, don't make any vows. Do not say by heaven because heaven is God's throne. That's not your place. So you can't say by heaven. And do not say by earth because the earth is his footstool. And do not say by Jerusalem for Jerusalem is the city of a great king. Do not even say by my head for because you cannot turn one hair white or black. Just a simple yes or no. Anything beyond that he says is evil. The law is don't make vows that you don't keep it. He said, but I say to you, the spirit of that law is simply say, yes, I will or no, I won't. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Uh, don't promise to do something. <laughs> don't, oh yeah. He says, don't resist an evil person, but if he sues you in court and takes your shirt from him, give him your coat also. That's the spirit of it. That's the spirit of what I'm trying to give to you. Jesus said, if a soldier demands you carry his guilt for a mile, then carry it for two miles. Give to those who ask. Don't turn them away from what they want to borrow. You've heard the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's the spirit of what I'm trying to get to you. The law by itself kills. You know why it kills? Because you can't keep the law. I gave it to you and nobody could keep it. So that's why Jesus had to come and he said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. And by fulfilling the law, 
when I take your righteousness, which is filthy rags, and give you my robe of righteousness to put on, then you can walk in the spirit of what I did for you. Uh, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Somebody look at your neighbor and say, walk in the spirit of it. Walk in the spirit of the law. Walk in the spirit of the law. I'm going somewhere with it. Just hang on. You know, when you, when you start preaching stuff that people have never heard in church, they get this side-eyed look. They get this smirk look. They get this religious look. You know, they get, but I've come against the devil today. And I'm coming in here to stomp the devil out of here and to run him off. I'm tired of religion and I want relationship with Jesus Almighty. Am I talking to anybody? I'm tired of people judging everybody. I'm tired of being judged. Oh, y'all. He says, if you love only those who love you, what reward is that? How is that any good? The spirit of the word is to love those who don't love you. The spirit of the word is to pray for your enemies. Bless those who despitefully use you. Pray for them. Love them. Don't judge them. Uh, here's, here's the thing. God tells Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. Now, if I don't know who God has blessed or cursed, why would I want to curse anybody? <laughs> my, my. This is all about Jesus, y'all. So 1 Corinthians is where I really was going to go today. So just hang with me. 1 Corinthians 12. This is Volunteers, Volunteer Sunday. It's the spirit that gives life. He says, all of you together, I'm at verse 27, 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed to the church. First, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gifts of healing, those who help, those who have the gift of leadership, and those who speak in unknown tongues. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret in unknown languages? Of course not. Verse 31, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. Now watch this. This is what I love about God. He says, I've got this whole group of people that's a body. But they're in trouble. Because every one of them is trying to be the preacher. Every one of them wants to be the prophet. Everybody wants to be an apostle. I asked a guy once, hello. I asked a guy one time, I said, who made you a bishop? He said, I did. I said, ah, my goodness. It's all right, brother Yancey. I won't step on it again. Thank you. You don't want me to step on it again? You, you wouldn't laugh if I fell, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I know Carl would. Anyway. <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> He's, I asked him, I said, who made you a bishop? He said, I did. I said, then what you bishoping over? He said, whatever I choose to. So we got, we got so many people in the body of Christ that don't have an understanding 
that for $39.99 in the back of Charisma magazine, you can get ordained. You can be ordained, but that don't make you nobody in the body. Come on, y'all, talk to me. The Bible says that he places us in the body where it pleases him. Not everybody is an apostle. Not everybody is a prophet. Not everybody is a pastor. Not everybody is an evangelist. Not everybody is a teacher. Just because you think you are doesn't mean you are. Because if you are a leader and ain't nobody following you, you're just on a good walk. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? There has to be some reality to all of this. And he says that it's, it's apostles, it's prophets, it's evangelists, it's teachers, it's all of these people that are a part of who I am. He said, but there's also that is equally important. I got helpers. Now, I hope I ain't making nobody mad. It's all right, huh? Are you hearing me? He said, the thing is, I've got helpers who are as important as the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the teachers. So I've come to tell somebody today who thinks that my little gig as a volunteer is not that big a deal. Can I tell you that if it wasn't for the volunteer, there would be no apostle. Can I tell you, if it wasn't for the helper, if it wasn't for the person who is helping, teaching a class, teaching a Sunday school, teaching little kids, working with uh, others, helping others, the word helper literally means to come alongside someone and take them by the arm as if they were about to fall. And help them along. In other words, God calls each house, each of us, to a vision. How many of you know what the vision is around here? Yes. Presence. Somebody say presence. Somebody say it's all about the presence. Teaching people how to access the presence of God through praise and through worship. And in the presence, there is where you find every need in your life is met in his presence. He can do more in 30 seconds in his presence than we can do in a lifetime of preaching. Come on, somebody. So it's all about his presence. So God calls a house to a vision. You, you'll hear it. You'll hear it in the name of the church most of the time. Encounter church. It's where you encounter God and you encounter his people. The potter's house. It's where the broken vessels go to get fixed. Bishop Jakes is a master at it. And that's his message. That's his theme. That's who he is. You can watch any kind of church around here. You'll follow and you'll hear the vision of the house in the name of the church. But watch this. Helpers are people who are called alongside to help the vision, not hinder. Oh, come on. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? They're called alongside not to say, well, let's stand back and see what he does. Because I can't do it by myself. Well, Bishop said he wanted to do this thing or that thing. Let's just wait and see what he does. I can't do everything by myself. God calls me as a visionary, calls Bishop Jakes as a visionary. You think Bishop Jakes is in there doing everything in his church? Come on, y'all, listen to me. Hear what I'm saying. It's the spirit. Somebody say spirit. It's the spirit of a thing that gives life. It's not just sit back and, well, let's see what he does. Let's see. If, Let's see if it flies or if it falls. Do you know how many people 
that I've had to remove from some sort of office in this church that have told me that this church is going to fail as soon as I walk out this door. And I'm like, wow, really? Why did God call you to pastor then? Why didn't God call you to pastor? Because if you leave and it fails, then I'm in trouble. Because I thought he called me here. But it looks like we're still here. And it looks like it's 22 years later. Am I talking to anybody? Hear what I'm saying. And here's the reason why we're still here. Let me tell you the reason why we're still here is because we understand there is a better way. It's called love. Come on, y'all. The Spirit, somebody say, the Spirit gives life. Come on, say it again. Say, the Spirit gives life. Come on, say it one more time. The Spirit gives life. There are two or three things that the Bible says God is. One of them is God is a spirit. Somebody say spirit. God is love. So can I tell you, it's the love that gives life. Somebody asked me one time, they said, why do you think God gave you such a diverse church? And I said, I have no idea. Perhaps it's just because I love people. It's just, it, perhaps because I think everybody has value. Perhaps it's just because I think everybody brings something to the table. Come on, y'all. Perhaps it's because I like the idea that we all have different cultures. That way we ain't all just alike. Thank God everybody ain't like me. <laughs> so what's this? Paul said, so here's what I ask you to desire. It's the most helpful gift. But let me show you a way of life that is best of all. This is what the apostle Apostle Paul said, it's the best of all. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but don't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others. I would be nothing. Are y'all listening to this? I'm done preaching. I'm just, we're going to do this. We're going to go eat lunch. Y'all ready? He said, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Come on, somebody. He said, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Can I help you with something? You want to know if you're in a love walk? Do you want to? That's not a rhetorical question. Y'all can say yes or no. Do you want to know if you're in a love walk? Then take the word love out and put your name in. Gary is patient and kind. Gary is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Carl does not demand his own way. Carl's not irritable. And Cheryl keeps no record of being wronged. 
She does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Dr. Noemi never gives up. Dr. Sharice never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. If you want to know if you're in a love walk, put your name in there. And begin to read it out over yourself. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. But love will last forever. What's this? Knowledge is partial and incomplete right now. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. I'm still seeing too many believers throwing childish tantrums. Come on, y'all. Talk to me, somebody. We found out how to get attention when we were little. And if we can't get attention now that we've grown, we revert back to our actions as when we were a little kid. And we throw tantrums. Or we scream loud. Or we tell funny jokes. Or we be obnoxious. Because whatever got us attention is the behavior we begin to exhibit. And this is what Paul said. He said, when I was a kid, I used to do that kind of stuff. But when I grew up, I just began to love people. I put away this childish mess. And I said, you know what? Let me have some real empathy for my fellow man. Let me show some respect to my fellow man. Let me be authentic about me. Not, not trying to tell you how you feel. Let me tell you how I feel. I don't know how you feel. That's a judgment call. Are y'all with me? He said, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. And all I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things, he says, will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. I know this is not pew jumping and it's not, you know, head bobbing and all that kind of stuff and foot stomping and running the aisles kind of preaching. But I'm going to tell you, if we don't grab hold of love in this season, of our fellow man, of one another, quit looking at each other, through jaded eyes take your rose colored lens off or take your judgment colored lens off take the harshness out of your spirit did not Jesus say this did not he say love one another even as I have loved you can I ask you a question how many times did you mess up that Jesus let you come back How many times did something happen in your life that you know wasn't just right, but yet Jesus was standing right there in mercy and love and forgiveness, arms open wide, and he embraced you and restored you and put you back. Why do you think he told the story of the prodigal son? He wasn't talking about some abstract farmer out here or, or rich man that had some kids or something. No, he was telling us, this is what I came to do to restore all of those who have run away from father's house back to the perfect love of a father. The love that Jesus manifested by giving up all of glory, all of heaven, all of what heaven had to offer. You know, the, the serpent came through, uh, uh, or Satan came through a serpent. 
to talk to mankind. Jesus came the right way. He came through the womb. He came through the front door, not the back. He walked straight on, head in, and actually took on everything that we feel. He said, we have a high priest that is not, he's not at odds with our affirm infirmities. He knows exactly what we're feeling. He knows exactly what we're dealing with. He was human. And yet in his humanity, he loved us in spite of us and kept on loving us in spite of us and then left his most precious gift to us, his church. <laughs> and why would we take his church and treat it as if it's our own? When it was his in the first place and will forever be his. And why would we not love it the best we can to bring the spirit of love, the spirit of life into the house, y'all. It is the spirit that gives life. I can beat you to death with rules. Some people get mad because I don't preach a lot of rules. But you can live rules on the outside and your inside still be just as messed up as the day is long. I don't preach a lot of rules because I preach relationship. I want you in relationship with God. And I want you to be in such relationship with God that when something comes your way that is not of God, you are able to discern for yourself. Because what does it matter if I'm not there to tell you? Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do the other thing. I'm the one that preaches the rules. And if I'm not there to tell you, then you're going to mess it up when it comes your opportunity to stand up and show how strong you are in God. So I preach relationship. If you get relationship, then the love of God that fills your heart will cause you to want to walk holy and righteous and in purity and not mess up. Somebody say it is his spirit that gives life. Would you stand with me? Does this help anybody today? Yeah. Hallelujah. So what does that mean then when other people judge us? <laughs> we get to love them. We don't talk about them. We get to pray for those who despitefully use us. See, the same thing that we'd like everybody else to do is the thing we get to do. We get to be the example. We get to be the example. Justin, we get to love one another in spite of. Help each other in spite of. Stand true to each other, even when we don't understand each other. Still stand true because that's my brother. That's my family. This is where God called me. How dare you tell me God called you here and five minutes later you change his mind? My, my. Oh, God called me to this church. Three Sundays come by and ain't seen you since. How did God call you but he messed up? He messed up? Did he? Did he? He messed up? Or did you? Yeah. I'm trying to help you understand something today. The spirit of Christmas, the spirit of Christ coming is all about the spirit of love. And y'all, we have to love one another. We have to lay down judgment. We have to lay down attitude. We have to lay down the pointing of fingers. Have to
to stop talking about things you have no idea about. You don't know the context of it. You don't know anything about it. And you out here running your mouth and you're trying to confuse people and mess people up. You need to stop it. The Bible says to mark those who cause division among you. Thank God for love. Thank God for a family that loves one another. Thank God for a house full of volunteers who have the ministry of help. And they do it not because they're trying to prove a point. They do it because they love. Can you just put your hands together for one another today and say, I appreciate you, my brother. I appreciate you, my sister. While you're clapping your hands, just look at somebody and tell them, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Really appreciate you. I appreciate you. Appreciate you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thank God for you. I thank God for you. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. God, we ask that you be real in us. Cause us to love one another. God, stop all the, the little bickering and the carrying on in the body of Christ. It's so silly. Let us love one another. The reason that you came, Jesus. The reason you were born. The reason you died. The reason you rose again was because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So Father, today we believe in you. We believe in you, Jesus. And we thank you. We ask you that your love be made manifest in us in the most powerful and conspicuous ways, God. Because it's by this, it's not by speaking in tongues, it's not by healings, it's not by miracles, but it is by love one to another that all people will know that we're your disciples. So Father, let that kind of love rule and reign in this house. And for that, we thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. If you agree with that today, would you put your hands together and bless the Lord? Come on, come on, bless him real good. Come on, bless him real good. Hallelujah. Now, I know some of you may feel uncomfortable doing it, but I want you to look at somebody before you walk out of here today and say, I sure love you, my brother. I sure love you, my sister. You don't have to be mushy about it, but you can just tell somebody, I love you. And let's go to the bridge. We thank God for the food we're going to eat over there in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I love you all, and I bless you in Jesus' name. Go in the peace and the grace of God. Let's go get a little food.